Today, we're talking about relaxation in sport. There's a conflict, definitely, when people talk about relaxation or why athletes might need certain relaxation techniques around times of competition. And this conflict comes from the fact that people understand they need to be hyped up. They understand they need a certain level of both physiological and psychological stress to perform at their best. So why would you be trying to counteract this with some relaxation techniques? Today, what we're going to start off by is just talking about why athletes might need to be able to relax. We're going to talk about what the literature says around certain techniques for relaxation. And then we're going to finish off with kind of three quick tips that you might be able to use if you're going into competition or if you find certain areas of training to be more stressful than others. Uh, And I'll talk a small bit about why one technique might work better than the others for you. Right, so starting off, what is relaxation? Relaxation basically is the lessening or the reduction of stress. So like Certain symptoms of anxiety can be reduced. Certain symptoms of like physiological stress can be reduced through relaxation. There's a really good paper that will kind of help inform you around this topic. And it's called Relaxation Techniques and Sports Performance. It's by Parnabas et al. in 2014. And this is what a lot of our kind of different techniques and where a lot of our empirical data will come from today. So relaxation as a technique to reduce anxiety, we need to first look at anxiety and what kind of different components there will be to it. So most of the time when we're looking at anxiety around sports performance, it's this kind of two-pronged approach. So there is cognitive anxiety and then there is somatic anxiety and both of those have different symptoms. So the cognitive anxiety mainly deals with the kind of things that are going on inside our head, right? So negative self-talk, it might be self-evaluation, it might be uh, negative imagery around the task or the skill you're about to uh, take part in, it might be remembrance of previous negative experiences. So these are negative thought processes, they're uh, conscious or subconscious, and they're going on in our head. The somatic side of that then is the physiological symptoms. So it's things like increased heart rate, increased muscular tension, increased blood pressure. Uh, It might be an increase in core body temperature. It might be trembles or tremors that you'll have in your hands. So all of these things are things people will associate with being nervous, right? The butterflies in your stomach, the shaky hands before you go into a job interview. Okay, how prevalent is the use of relaxation techniques in sport? Well, a great place to figure out about uh, how prevalent something is in sport is to go and see where you've had positive drug tests for using banned substances to combat it. So you'll see like uh, in certain sports where injury is very, very high, you'll have certain peptide use or certain healing compound use is going to be incredibly high. When you start looking into sport and high performance sport, like an Olympics is a great place to look. And if you look at positive drug tests from the Olympics, a huge amount of athletes are using banned substances to try and combat these somatic effects and combat the cognitive effects that anxiety before a competition can have. A good example of just how prevalent this is, is like a 2007 paper by Simon looks at the prevalence of banned substances being used. And it's about six out of 10 people who are using a banned substance could be found to be using something which is combating cognitive effects or combating pre-competition anxiety. There's another article published in 2012, a Wilson article, which is dealing with the same thing, and it comes out around the same, around 60%. So obviously there's a super high prevalence rate, right? And it's it's being kind of backed up by our findings from uh, adverse analytical findings. So what can relaxation help us to do? What do the techniques look like? So what relaxation can allow us to do is, is combat both sides of that anxiety fork, right? Okay. If we look first at the cognitive side, right, and a lot of the stuff for this next piece is coming from a book called Understanding Sports Psychology. It's by Ambofo Botang. I think it's 2009 it was published. So they talk about this kind of paradox where you have an apparent reduction in cognitive anxiety will increase performance. And there's a lot of papers showing this. There's a lot of studies done, both cross-sectional studies and interventional studies where they put people under increased cognitive anxiety or they'll increase cognitive anxiety symptoms in individuals and they'll measure their performance. So we know that to be true. So we think reducing all those cognitive anxiety symptoms could be good, right? 
But the second branch of this, the somatic anxiety thing, is where we start to see a small bit of a drift in the research and a small bit of a split in people's opinions. So originally people would think that, okay, if you want to reduce cognitive anxiety through relaxation, then reducing somatic anxiety through relaxation or somatic anxiety symptoms through relaxation is going to be positive. But if you look at that for more than kind of 10 seconds, you'll start to realize, okay, if I'm going to do a 100 meter sprint, the last thing I want to be doing is a breathing technique that will really reduce my blood pressure, reduce my heart rate, reduce my ability to transport oxygen around the body. That's going to be a terrible thing, right? And when you look at a lot of the the somatic side of things, like the physiological symptoms of anxiety, these are also corresponding with physiological symptoms of being warmed up or being hyped up. So there's this immediate thing that, okay, I probably don't want to be all the way relaxed, but then on the opposite side of the scale, do I want to be all the way hyped up? If I'm a bobsledder just before I take off down the track do I need to have a heart rate of 180 beeps per minute do I need to have a blood pressure that's through the roof right you probably don't and in most sporting cases a super ramped up somatic uh, nervous system isn't going to be a great thing because you're going to have to continually have a certain output your event will probably last longer than three seconds So it may not be a thing that like, okay, all the way down the bottom isn't good. I don't want to be falling asleep before I go and throw a hammer. But at the same time, I don't want to be super hyped up before I throw. Right, so what is this relationship? What they call it in a lot of research is an inverted U. So basically, all the way at relaxed is going to be bad, right? So you can imagine the x-axis to be like how hyped up or how relaxed you are. You can imagine the y-axis to be... Uh, your performance, right? So inverted U or like an N. Down here at the start, I'm super relaxed. My performance is really low, right? As I come up, there's going to be this kind of plateauing area in the middle where I have high performance and I'm somewhere in the middle of relaxed and super hyped up. And then as I go down to the side, I'm going to have, when I get all the way up to hyped up, I'm going to have a negative effect on performance. So then we start looking at the use of these relaxation techniques, when they should be used and when they should be applied, and this kind of drifting between relaxed and hyped up, and where we should be sitting to get the most of our performance. So what are these techniques? Okay, I'm just going to rattle off some examples. There's some muscular tension release techniques, there are breathing techniques, there are meditation techniques, there are mental imagery techniques that will help with relaxation, there's a whole host of things, right? All the way down to chanting certain mantras before you you take part in a skill. What you'll start to notice is with a lot of these techniques, there's going to be a corresponding technique to increase that somatic anxiety. So when I have a breathing technique to help me reduce anxiety and to increase relaxation, the I can very simply change around certain parameters with these breathing techniques and they'll help me to get hyped up. An example of this, right, a simple breathing technique to help with reducing anxiety or or increasing relaxation prior to a sports skill or a movement skill would be box breathing, right? A, like, there's a huge amount of parameters around box breathing. It seems to have been patented by everyone. But an example of box breathing would be you would breathe in for six seconds, hold your breath for six seconds, exhale for six seconds, hold your breath for six seconds where a lot of you might have heard about this before is through like seal fit crossfit they used to do loads of stuff on box breathing back in the day it's actually really good technique aside from this for uh helping powerlifters or people who want to squat big weights um or pull big weights breathe into their belt box breathing could be really good but a box breathing technique can help me to lower my heart rate it can help me to lower my blood pressure uh it can help bring down a lot of that somatic anxiety The opposite end of that would be a hyperventilation technique, which would help me to ramp up uh, my oxygen levels in my blood, would help me to ramp up my heart rate, and it can actually increase my core body temperature. So by simply changing a few parameters within the technique, like it's still a breathing technique, I'm going to be able to either relax an athlete, so I might have an athlete who's freaking out before they go out to hit their last attempt. So if it's a weightlifter and they've missed their first two snatches, 
they're starting to hyperventilate in the warm-up room. They're waiting to go for their next attempt. They're on the verge of a mental breakdown. Simple breathing techniques can help, right? They can draw them from being all the way over here at hyped up. They can increase performance and come slightly back to just a bit more relaxed and get better performances because of it. But if my breathing techniques are wrong and the athlete might hear what I'm saying incorrectly, right? Or I, I just use the wrong words, I can ramp up somatic anxiety even higher. So when you see, uh, we'll use the bobsledder example again, or you'll see a sprinter example again, when you see people doing the short, sharp breath, so <laughs> just before they go, or you'll see certain lifters doing it just before they lift. All of these things are increasing the level of oxygen in their blood. They're increasing their heart rate. If I do that with the lifter who's just about to go out and, and probably fail their third attempt, I'm going to have a terrible effect. I'll drive them further into that heightened somatic anxiety stage and I'm going to reduce their performance even more. Right, mental imagery then is another example of a relaxation technique that could help increase performance. So in the way where my breathing techniques previously we talked about, they have an effect on the somatic anxiety or the, the somatic symptoms, mental imagery will have an effect on the cognitive symptoms, right? So the the negative self-talk that might be a a thing we need to alter with a relaxation technique, the, the things they're thinking about. So basically thought processes they're having around the task or around the skill or around the competition they're just about to do. An example of a mental imagery piece would be just before an Olympian goes out to throw a discus. If I'm doing a mental imagery piece, so mental imagery can be used pre-competition or it can be used in training or it can be used uh, when somebody's just learning a skill for the first time. And when we look at mental imagery being used as a relaxation technique, we're looking to ramp up certain things, right? So positive self-talk is usually one of the things we're trying to ramp up. We want them to have a positive thought process. We want them to be excluding noxious stimuli. So those of you from last week will remember like noxious stimuli are things that really take away from our concentration, right? So if that hammer thrower or discus thrower is about to go out and they're really worried about how a certain judge is going to judge where the hammer falls on the ground, we want to be using mental imagery to exclude that from the current thought process. What you'd usually see here is, is this being delivered through a coach or through a, a practitioner that's very close to the athlete. That something we'll probably talk about in the next few weeks is like who should be delivering sports psychology intervention pieces obviously sports psychologists are, are number one for this but there's a lot of research being done on coaches using sports psychology techniques to increase performance in athletes and there's some really interesting findings there are actually um around who's delivering the intervention and, and how it's perceived so we might look at that in the next few weeks but if I'm a coach and I'm trying to do a mental imagery piece what I'm probably going to be looking at is like okay a previous performance that went well so I'm talking about where they were competing. We talked about mental imagery before being this kind of totally encompassing thing. So it's not just a visual image we have in our heads. They're thinking about how they feel. So the, the feelings they have within their body, thinking about thoughts, they're thinking about uh, the things they're hearing, how the wind feels, how the crowd are reacting to them walking out. So mental imagery, if used in the correct setting, can be really, really positive to kind of push away the cognitive side of things. So all the negatives that could be taking away from our relaxation and pushing us further up that kind of hyped up scale so our, our cognitive anxiety is getting higher and we're going to have that associated decrease in performance. Meditation then is the last thing. And meditation for most people has a, a barrier for entry that's sufficiently high that they're not willing to try it, right? Uh, I'm not like a big meditator myself. I just don't really enjoy it. Um, practices in, in like mindfulness, I just don't react quite well to it. But meditation has never been so easy for people to try and so easy for, to, for people to try with relative success, right? So when you look at things that are important for meditation to be successful in a relaxation term, you're probably looking at Practicing it as a skill, and that's something we're going to talk about a little bit later with all three of these, you need to be listening to the correct advice and then also like using all the other things we have. So we have like the Calm app, we have the Headspace app, we have videos and guided meditation. And it's something that if you think you're going to start using a relaxation technique in your performances or in your training environment, 
then it's probably something you should look to like, okay, what's the best one for me to use right now, right? So if it's app-based, great. You can download the free app or you can use a really, really cheap app. You can use it on a daily basis and it will track it or a, every, two times a week and it will track it. Or you might need to find somebody on YouTube or on the internet who has guided meditation pieces and you start practicing that in the same way you'd practice a mental imagery skill or in the same way you'd practice a an overhead squat. Right, the last piece then is relaxation as a skill. So I spoke about, I, I rattled off a load of different things that will help you relax or a load of different techniques. We spoke about three different techniques. All of these things have to be practiced. So there's no point in me being that athlete who's missed their first two snatches. I'm shitting the bed in the warm-up room and now I'm like, oh, I need to try and relax. If you understand that these heightened levels of anxiety around times of performance are an issue for you, then you need to start looking at these relaxation techniques as something you're going to practice in your training. So I am going to log into the Headspace app three times a week after every squat session, right? Or like just pick certain sessions or certain time markers within the week. And after those, you're going to do a relaxation technique. There's more relaxation techniques out there than I could ever go into in this video. What I will say is look at those papers I mentioned at the start. Particularly, there's a paper by Pine Chatal in 2014 that's going to be linked in the, the description of this video. They'll go into a host of different techniques, right? This probably isn't going to be a one fits all where I can just tell you to go and do this technique and it will work for everyone. It probably won't even work for you all the time. But if you understand this about yourself, that like certain things, certain exercises, certain lifts, certain skills you have to do within your sport, increase the level of anxiety you feel and you have an associated decrease in performance because of it, relaxation techniques are probably something you should look into. Thanks very much for watching, guys. If you want any more information around our coaching, our consultancy, our work we do with sports teams and gyms, go to the website. It's linked below, seekastrength.com. If you want to watch more videos, just click the channel and we have literally over 100 videos there that are similar to this and quite different from this. And then the last thing is, if you want more long-form discussions, there is a podcast that comes out every week called the Seek a Strength Podcast. That's linked below as well. And there's a shit talk podcast that's just me and Gurf talking about everything except sports performance. Thanks very much for watching. See you next week.